Hey everybody, it's Albert, and uh, this video will be, as you, one might guess from the title, discussing some of the things with claims involving Jesus and astrology and the zodiac. Um, uh, some of it overlap, a lot of it overlapping, of course, things like you might find in the movie Zeitgeist. Now, some, if those of you who've seen previous videos I've done in Zeitgeist, a lot of this stuff is not going to be new. The uh, reason I'm presenting it now is I'll, I'll be taking a lot of those videos down, mainly because they involved confrontations with particular YouTubers, and I'm not really interested in going in that direction anymore. It tends to be, in my mind, counterproductive. I'd rather just put the stuff out there as um, without interact necessarily in response to someone. I, I would rather just produce the material, uh, you know, rather than deal with someone who's done nothing but regurgitate Acharya S books um, and hasn't really looked at anything really scholarly at all in terms of these issues. So that's kind of why I'm doing it again here and I'll be taking those earlier videos down and just kind of letting a few, like I did the more recent one on Dying and Rising Gods and I'll be doing this one as well which deals more with the issue of the sun and astrology and that sort of thing. And rather than, and, and at some point I may do something with, with the various gods, so supposed parallels, but I want to get this part out first because uh, this is more foundational actually than specific parallels. Uh, this is at the core of their theory uh, because this is taught, you, you, as, as I pointed out in the Dying Rising Gods video, it's not that you could pick an occasional parallel, although they certainly the ones they have, most of them are completely overblown or even non-existent. But even if you came across an occasional parallel, without an underlying structure to tie things together, it could just in fact be a coincidence or in fact be a matter of interpretation. Uh, what happens is that when you point out the various problems, uh, for example, the fact that really Christianity isn't associated with for example, December 25th until rather late in the game, uh, they'll point to this sort of under, underlying astrological thing. It's, no, 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 see, it all ties in with this. And, this and, and so it becomes important to address the specific issues. And what I find is that even Christian apologists uh, miss the boat completely on this one because they kind of let the whole astrology thing kind of stand out there and say, oh, well, it doesn't really apply to Christianity. Well, it, in fact, it doesn't, but what they miss is that what they're saying doesn't really apply to paganism either. That z things like zeitgeist doesn't just get Christianity wrong, it gets paganism wrong. And I think that's a key issue here. And, and once you realize that, you see the whole thing's a house of cards and just totally collapses. Um, so so I, I want to make this clear. And, and one of the things, for example, is, as, I'll, as we move along, I'll, I, I want to point out is that the whole solar mythology they like to paint is very, very ancient. You know, the whole December 25th winter solstice bit. In terms of the Roman Empire, for example, that really, that whole idea with the sun god and the, and the winter solstice is something that actually comes in rather late. Um, in second and third centuries, you know, with, with the introduction of the cult of Sol Invictus, with the Roman version of Mithraism and, and the way it develops and ties in with Sol Invictus. Prior to that, sun gods did not necessarily have anything to do with December 25th in terms of a celebration of their days. It, it's that whole mythology that they're presenting is late. And so there's, there's whole problems with anachronisms. And we'll get more into the, this as we go along. But there's also anachronisms in terms of you, 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 you realize if you look at their sources and trace their sources, eventually a lot of it goes back to the late 18th through the mid 19th centuries. Um, and there's a reason for this. And the reason you don't find this sort of thing presented by scholars any, at any point in the 20th century is that things like, for example, the development of the Zodiac, um, it was assumed for a long time uh, that the Zodiac goes back many, many millennia in terms of its use and, and, and understanding that because a lot of writers in late antiquity said so. Well, they were wrong, um, but we, there was nothing else to go on other than, than the Greco-Roman uh, texts 
they, they hadn't um, at some point they had not really deciphered the hieroglyphs and even when they did it took a long time to sort of accumulate all the information and make sense of it they it wasn't until they discovered the, the cuneiform tablets and were able to decipher those that you were able to understand what really went on in in parts of the ancient Near East so none of this really was available until you get into the the 20th century and once they, it did the whole thing became obvious that the use of the zodiac is actually was actually a rather recent development in terms of all of history that it is not something that went back many many millennia um, so the, and that presents a real problem because their idea of for example the, the god Horus being based on the zodiac as was the, the Persian Mithra it's wrong it just falls apart again so uh, a lot of these things just dissolve once you understand the foundational issues and so I want to kind of deal with that and also deal with this source in terms of um, as, as I pointed out a lot of this goes back to 19th century writers uh, in particular a lot of esoteric occultic writers of the 19th century or quasi occultic writers those who are on the sort of fringe ends of it um, and we're talking not just people like Gerald, uh, I mean, certainly Godfrey Higgins and Albert Churchward, but also those who were more into spiritualism for a period, guys like Gerald Massey, etc. So, so you get this whole, that, that whole stream of thinking, and that was the core of it back in the 19th century. But, that does, but then after the discoveries were made, it kind of died out until it was more recently re revived. And, and so the question is why? Was there some new information? Well, no, there wasn't. But what there was was a new kind of social um, phenomena, and that is the phenomena of the conspiracy theorists. Um, they had been around for some time, of course, but it wasn't until the last decade and a half that this thing has taken on more of a, a in terms of a significant movement in terms of the, cult, the popular culture. Um, and particularly once the the internet becomes available and, and and any crazy theory can get a can get a basically become uh, suddenly ex be exposed and mil millions of people can be exposed of it to it almost instantaneously and and it's just the way things are nowadays um, that and there's some and there are a lot of people who are fairly gullible and they bought into this a lot of this stuff and the first person is fine really reviving this sort of thing in a big way um, was a fellow named Jordan Maxwell who is one of the arch conspiracy theorists of the early 90s um, into the into the late 90s and he produced a lot of not not much in terms of writing but a lot of videos and that he sold um, he sold a lot of videos of his lectures and a lot of them are on YouTube you can find them uh, and Jordan Maxwell was pretty much, I mean, in terms of anyone who looks at the scholarly evidence, the guy's a joke. Um, and, and to give you an example of this sort of kind of insanity, he was one of these people who was very much into, etym into what I call crackpot etymologies, where they just take words and say, well, this means this, and, and tie in any way they want to, just because words share sounds, he assumes that they must have some connection. And let, of course, if he wants them to, if he doesn't, then, then it, that he just ignores it. But for example, he decided at, at one point that in, in that Abraham or that the Judaism was sort of the age of Aries, and I'll get into this. Is, so so a, the original name Abraham's original name Abram um, was Ab, which was a prefix which could mean father in, in Hebrew. So, so Ab Ram, Abram, um, and therefore father of the Ram. And he decided that this was a sign of Aries. Well. Of course, the real problem there is that Abram is a Hebrew name, and while the prefix Ab is, a he is Hebrew, uh, the Ram is modern English, so no. <laughs> and, but this is the sort of thing that gets taken seriously by crackpot followers of Jordan Maxwell. And don't try to tell me he didn't say it, because I've got it on video. Um, <laughs> so this, but this is the sort of thing that, that these people will, will take seriously, and in fact, as, as I'll describe later, when you get into the whole God's son thing, S-U-N versus S-O-N, that is something that Jordan Maxwell um, does, came up with. Um, so the, this sort of thing, does, that sort of conspiracy theory end of it is a very big part. And this is the, in fact, in the, movie, in the film Zeitgeist, 
In an interview, when it first came out, Peter Joseph said specifically that the entire film was basically a walk through all of Jordan Maxwell's work, pretty much. And you have to understand, Jordan Maxwell was important to conspiracy theories, because whereas previous conspiracy theorists would, let's say, they'd be into the Kennedy assassination, or they'd be into something else, or religion, or whatever. Jordan Maxwell was the first, what I like to call a pan-conspiracist, basically who would take all these different conspiracy theories and tie them all together as one part of one grand unified conspiracy theory. It's sort of like the theory of everything for crackpots. But that's basically what he was into, and Peter Joseph was very much taken in by this, and that's what the original film, Zeitgeist, was basically a walk through the work of Jordan Maxwell, or a lot of it, because of the whole thing, the Federal Reserve and 9-11, Jordan Maxwell made a bunch of stuff about it, and then of course the whole astrotheology thing was very big with Jordan Maxwell, and this is where this is all coming from in more recent times, and this is where you get a lot of this stuff, in the basically conspiracy theorists slash alternative history, which is basically pseudo-history, pseudo-archaeology, all of this kind of ties in, and Maxwell was very much key to unifying a lot of these different groups, so this is where it's all coming from. It's not serious scholarship at all. No one, in terms of really studying these issues, takes these people seriously. So you have to understand this is where it's coming from. So having that in view, at this point we'll start beginning talking about some of the specific issues. While certainly the sun was deified in many ancient cultures, it is not true as claimed in Zeitgeist, for example, that that there was this sort of uniform idea of solar deities being the creator god. And in fact, in many cultures, the solar deity was not even the most important god. For example, the, the, the Greco-Roman gods associated with the sun, Helios and Apollo, uh, generally took a back seat to Zeus or Jupiter, um, in, who was the, sky, the god of sky and thunder. Now, there certainly there were places where the sun god took on a great deal more importance, and there were some where the sun god was even considered, or at least one of the versions of the sun god were considered a creator god. For example, in Egypt, there the there were a sun gods who were considered creator beings or who were associated with the sun. But you have to understand in Egypt many gods were associated with the sun. They were not necessarily sun gods but associated with an aspect of the sun rather than the sun itself as a, as, as in its entirety. Um, and so you, you have to understand Egypt is such an, uh, a unique case in terms of its culture and its, and its religion that it really doesn't translate well into other cultures. It's, it's a very unique animal. Uh, but such confusion on these matters certainly reflects the West traditional viewing of the ancient world primarily from the lens of Hellenistic authors. Uh, since there were no real writings from ancient Egypt that were deciphered, um, the, in the, or from the ancient cultures in the ancient Near East, Western scholars assumed the cultures of where they, from from these peri these countries where they did have re things to read, which would have been during the Hellenistic period, that things that were part of the culture then they assumed were always part of that culture, and that's not really the case. Uh, the Hellenization of these regions, uh, beginning with Alexander the Great's conquest and subsequent Hellenistic dynasties, for example the Ptolemies in Egypt and the, and the Seleucids in the Near East, uh, really altered the culture drastically from what had gone before so into a hybrid where, of the, where it took elements of the existing culture but basically put them into a, Greco, into a Greek framework. Um, now beginning in the Renaissance, where a lot of where a lot of the the Greco-Roman authors were recovered, um, 
they relied heavily in that era upon them for their understanding of history, and this reinforced these misconceptions during this period. Even after the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone and the discovery of the cuneiform tablets, it would take decades to break free from the earlier prejudices and allow these cultures in their original form to speak for themselves. Now, this has been accomplished to a large extent through the 20th century to our own day, but earlier views from the Renaissance period continue to be defended originally, or they continue to be defended originally by occultists and still by many occultists, and more recently by the pseudo-scholarship of the conspiracy theorists. Now, certainly you can see this sort of error happening in how Zeitgeist treats the, quote, solar theology. For example, Platonism was an extremely powerful influence on all religions in the region. The importance of the sun as a symbol for the divine within Platonism led many educated pagans to see the gods as manifestations of some single divine force that was represented by the sun. Now, a lot of the stories of these gods were reconfigured in late antiquity into solar metaphors, but this happens in late antiquity. It's not really part of their original mythology at all. It's a later adaptation of existing beliefs to match the developing cultural consensus, particularly within Neoplatonic philosophy, because at this point, Neoplatonism in late antiquity is very much a quasi-philosophical religion, and many religions used it, both in terms of terminology, but also in terms of ideas. It kind of built upon a lot of this and blended in with Neoplatonic thought. The important thing here, though, is that antiquity is not monolithic. Cultural differences were important. As I pointed out, Egypt was its own unique case and really cannot be understood. It doesn't translate well across cultures, necessarily. So you really need to treat each of these cultures within their own spheres. You have to understand how Egypt saw things or how the Babylonians or the Persians or the Jews or the Greeks or the Romans in different periods saw things, rather than looking at them much later when Greco-Roman culture had basically saturated the entire Mediterranean world, and you had a much more uniform picture than what would have occurred earlier. A claim that comes early in the Zeitgeist film, for those familiar with it will recall this, is that as far back as 10,000 BC, history is abundant with carvings and writings showing admiration and respect for the sun. Now, while certainly ancient man looked with wonder upon that giant bowl of fire in the sky, uh, the claim of writings from 10,000 BC concerning the sun, or frankly writings from 10,000 BC concerning anything at all, uh, would come as a surprise to archaeologists. You see, there really is no, nothing resembling something we would consider writing in terms of like, a, a language a, uh, until 6,000 years after that, you know, around 4,000 BC, you get the Sumerians and, and the Egyptians, um, the, the Prior to that time, you could have some, some. There are some symbol, symbol, symbols, or things like that in things like the Vinca culture, but uh, it's certainly nothing understood. And then we wouldn't have, we would have no idea what these writings are about. If, if they are in fact writings, they may just be some sort of, of more of a symbol, a sim, various symbols, but it's not necessarily a full text, linguistic text, in, in the way that we would understand it. And uh, then there's disputes on exactly what those things are, but certainly it's not until around 4000 BC that you actually have decipherable uh, linguistic text. So writings in 10,000 BC, I don't think so. Um, now, what's what's interesting though is is the why 10,000 BC, um, and and this is not something really addressed in the film, but if you understand where this is coming from, the whole conspiracy theorist end of thing end of things, you'll have some, or the occultic end of things, you'll have some greater understanding. Um, 
You see, what's really going on here is these ideas that there was once this worldwide uh, technologically advanced civilization that collapsed and and then basically it had this religious system that was based on nature is usually the way it's it's described and that when that collapsed the remnants of it the sort of pieces of it became uh, the religious systems of the world and and were corrupted and that's how we ended up with world that's how religion as we know it began um, and and what's interesting is the 11th millennia BC plays a big role in a lot of this um, certainly if you find this in theosophical writings and, and especially for example more recently in, in 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 the last century in the readings of a cult prophet or seer Edgar Casey who claimed the structures at Giza uh, the pyramids and the Sphinx and all were built by the survivors of Atlantis in 10,500 BC um, now this sort of connection of Casey's nonsense to contemporary astrotheology is, is even uh, made a little clearer if you read for example the writings of D.M. Murdoch, particularly in her book The Christ Conspiracy, um, who in that book she basically expounded it. It comes at the end of the book where she writes of, a, of an ancient technologically advanced global civilization that had no racism, sexism, and, or other ills, social ills, and whose religion was based upon nature. She claims that with the collapse of that civilization, the religion was corrupted by personifying the elements of nature, and this was used to enslave the masses. Um, from there, she rushes headlong into the land of tinfoil hats by drawing upon authors who use theories of lost continents and ancient astronauts to prove that the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx were not built by the Egyptians, but rather by the aforementioned lost technologically advanced civilization. Um, uh, in fact, at one point she claims that the Great Pyramid was not a tomb at all, but actually a celestial computer. Needless to say, you will not find many Egyptologists endorsing such conclusions, but it's important to really understand that this is the basis of, of a lot of this stuff, as silly as it is. This is where the, this is the the point of view where this is coming from. And by the way, the book that I mentioned, the Christ Conspiracy by D. M. Murdoch, I believe I believe that book she wrote under the under the pen name Acharya S. So they're, Acharya S. and D. M. Murdoch are the same person. But so I, I yeah. But understand that this is where this stuff com is coming from. This is the perspective. The Jordan Maxwell's the the, the Acharya S's. It's all a lot of it has is tied in, and, and a lot of times they'll cite. And, and it's sort of tied in, you'll find this in a lot of these alternative history slash conspiracy theorists, you know, um, John Anthony West and Graham Hancock and all this stuff. It's all pretty much, all these ideas are bouncing around in that whole subculture. And this is feeding, this is in fact just, this zeitgeist thing is just, and it's just kind of an offshoot of it. Um, I'm not saying that they all share necessarily all the, all the ideas that you see in that film, but it is really an offshoot from that whole alternative history conspiracy theorist subculture. This is just one manifestation of it. Now, one interesting topic of discussion is the use in Zeitgeist and elsewhere of, of the phrase God's Son, S-U-N, and its relationship to God's Son, as in Jesus, S-O-N. Uh, and this immediately has to raise eyebrows because uh, one has to wonder if someone's asserting here um, the, that somehow there is some connection between the two because of the coincidence of two in modern English homophones that when in fact the English language didn't exist in antiquity. Um, so the whole thing's kind of silly on that basis alone. Uh, now what's interesting is, is and, and, and what you'll find if you discuss this with some supporters of these ideas, particularly supporters of the film, say, well, that was only a pun. I mean, you can't, you know, you, that it's basically saying you're you're making a straw man out of this because it was actually only a pun. 
It was only intended as a pun. It really wasn't intended to be taken seriously. In fact, that's kind of the official word on the matter, as, as you'll find for in the recent um, Zeitgeist Source Guide, which is what's, uh, what's in fact produced now. Uh, however, what I would contend is that's not always been the case. That's just the official word now, but it wasn't the official word at the beginning because, in fact, all of this, most of the film, as I pointed out, comes from Jordan Maxwell. And in Jordan Maxwell's books and in Jordan Maxwell's films, this connection was taken seriously because, frankly, Jordan Maxwell's etymologies are absurd anyway, and this was just one more example of the sort of idiocy he came up with. And the fact that uh, Peter Joseph said this film was a walk through Jordan Maxwell and he used this and in fact this exact comparison is right from one of Jordan Maxwell's video, a number of his videos and books where it is in fact taken as something seriously um, that, that sort of plea that this is, oh I only meant this as a joke, no you didn't it's only when people pointed out that the whole thing was absurd that suddenly he did an about face and so, oh, well, it wasn't really meant to be taken seriously. Well, sorry, guy. You know, you, you got, kind of got caught on that one. Um, and, and the 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 whole godson absurdity, though, is it, it illustrates uh, the f problems this film has in the sense that it's relying primarily, at least in its original version, on the. Uh, material through the Maxwell. Now what's happened in the final cut version and in subsequent things like the source guide is they're trying to reinterpret everything to sort of make it look a little better uh, but you'll find that the new explanations don't fit the old ones and don't fit the original sources they use and, and it and it and things don't hang together at all. You don't have you have contradictions in the new interpretations and, and there's all sorts of problems there. Um, and as I pointed out that in fact this stuff does appear in Jordan Maxwell and it is taken and in the, um, among many ridiculous etymologies and the Abram one I gave is an example of the same sort of thing where he uses modern English at, in the explanation um, at, where it obviously it, it's ridiculous and but but I would point out that he wasn't the only that you know a lot, now that after that sort of thing got exposed he was relying a lot in his association with D.M. Murdoch slash Acharya S. Uh, but I would point out that Murdoch has done her own share of backtracking on this issue uh, of God's son S-O-N and God's son S-U-N. Uh, for example, now her and Joseph both, it, as you would find in the source guide, officially it says, concerning the son son play on words. See, now it's only a play on words, which is not a cognate. It's not a cognate, but a mere happy coincidence in English. Okay? So that's the official word. Now, as I pointed out, Joseph was relying on Murdoch where it wasn't, where it was taken seriously. But in one of Murdoch's earlier books, uh, in 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 the Sons of God, um, in 2000 from from 2004, Murdoch gave the exact opposite view, where she said, where in, in concluding after a long argument, which I'll get into in a moment, she said thus. The English word son, S-U-N, is not a false cognate with S-U-N, and it is truthfully said that the Son of God, S-O-N, is the Son of God, S-U-N. So, in fact, she's saying it, at that point, she was saying it's not a false cognate. So, really, Peter Joseph isn't the only one backtracking on this issue. Um, now, the, what I just mentioned by Murdoch, what Murdoch used as a source is for, the, for that conclusion was a fellow named Jacob Bryant. Now, Jacob Bryan was actually considered in his day a, a fine scholar, but in this case, his day was, oh, 1774? That's right. Her argument was based on something originally published before the United States of America existed. Uh, it, it gets even funnier when you read Brian, and yet, and, and to be in all fairness, this sort of stuff was very common in the in those days. This is, it, it, these sort of wild etymologies were very common in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, when people really would just hear two things that sounded alike and assumed if they wanted them to be connected, they were. Uh, Bryant's theory was that Noah's son Ham was worshipped as a sun god um, and was among others. Noah's son Ham was actually the Greek Zeus and the Egyptian Amun. 
that he made connections, then Bryant made connections with, between cultures using etymologies that were just unbelievable. For example, and the key one in this case is that he claimed the Egyptian priests had the title Sun Kin or Sun Kohen, as he says it was connected to, or priests of the sun. Now, the Sun Kin was S-O-N-C-H-I-N, is the way it was transliterated. Now, the way he derived this was via a tradition of Pythagoras being a pupil of an Egyptian priest. They gave the name Sun Kes, S-O-N-C-H-E-S. Now, he assumed what was clearly a proper name to also be a title, conjugated the plural form Sun Kin, assumed that Kin had an etymological connection to the Hebrew Kohen for priest, assumed a connection between the Egyptians and the British. He thought the Egyptians were somehow, had gotten their culture from the British. Don't ask. And then concluded S-O-N had an etymological connection to S-U-N, even though S-U-N really didn't exist at that point. English didn't even exist at that point. But this, never mind. Needless to say, this rather imaginative etymological exercise didn't carry weight with very many people these days, except apparently for a time with Murdoch. That is until she changed her mind and decided that S-U-N and S-O-N were not really cognate after all. I would imagine that, I'm not sure why exactly she changed her mind, probably because people couldn't stop laughing. So that sort of gives you an idea of what we're dealing with here. Now, also, there's the matter of the son being the savior. The source, again, the original source was Jordan Maxwell, who forced the connection to Jesus. He said the son rises every day, so it was the risen savior. Yeah. By this point, the less said about Maxwell, the better, since he really can't be taken seriously. But I'd rather, at this point, deal with a source that they actually use. It's like a source guide, for example, was Pausanias referring to the savior son. Now, what actually happens here is that the Pausanias reference is not to necessarily the bright object in the sky, although it's connected to it, but to a form of the god Helios, known as Helios Soter, which is, you know, Helios son, Soter means savior. Now, different gods of the time were given different titles, including Soter, in reference to events or attributes. Without knowing exactly who Helios had saved and from what, any connection to the Christian usage is mere guessing. What usually happens with gods who were declared savior or had the savior in one of their forms was like Helios Soter. It usually had something to do with some god was believed to have saved a particular city, for example, or a particular society, either with a military victory or from famine or from some disease epidemic of some sort. And then this form would develop where they would refer to this god as saving them, so it became, like in this case, Helios Soter. And it's not really, he doesn't really describe exactly what this form was about, so it's difficult to say exactly what it is. There's also the possibility this may have been an early, may have been connected to an early, since Pausanias is the second century, this may have been connected to an early form of the Roman cult of Sol Invictus or a nascent form. In any case, it really had nothing to, certainly had nothing to do with the sun saving anyone from their sins in 10,000 BC. It's at this point I'm going to get into one of the key factors in all of this. And remember, in Zeitgeist and in similar materials, it is assumed the zodiac is very, very ancient. It goes back many millennia, 10,000 BC maybe even, or longer according to some. But that turns out not to be the case. And that's key because, for example, you can't argue that the mythology of Horus is based on the zodiac when the zodiac isn't even around when that mythology develops. So obviously that, and the problem here is that once you've got that undermined, that whole idea undermined, the having this as the basis for later stories, for example, the story of Jesus becomes highly problematic to say the least, when it hasn't 
that, because the, remember the whole assumption is that Jesus was just one more example of a continuing pattern, but if that pattern doesn't really exist, then your whole premise just starts to uh, go into the sand, so to speak. Um, so let's get into exactly what we know about the Zodiac. Um, as I pointed out, prior to the century, a lot of people just assumed it was many millennia old. Uh, um, it, but once we started to see the evidence from the ancient cultures themselves uh, and put away our own biases, um, Western biases, it became pretty obvious that this wasn't the case. Uh, and, and the results of this scholarship is very important. In this, and, and I just have to make this point. The system of zodiacal astrology was not in use in ancient cultures mentioned in zeitgeist or similar materials prior to the first millennium BC when it develops gradually over, and we see its development. We can see it developing over many centuries in Babylon. It's not something that existed before then. Thus the claim the sun's movement through the zodiac was the basis of these ancient religions is uh, incredibly anachronistic, uh, I mean to say the least. Now, um, in terms of the details here, the, the gradual development of the zodiac is, and this is very well established, its roots are in Mesopotamia with ancient scribes keeping watch over the heavens, the Sumerians uh, named planets, they named constellations, uh, their interest was primar apparently primarily calendrical, related to yearly activities in agriculture. Um, perhaps in the late Sumerian period and then moving into the Akkadian period, there, you have some interest in, in, you see the astrology developing, but this is an entirely different kind of astrology. It's an omen-based astrology, things like comets, conjunctions, and other unusual occurrences rather than something necessarily in a relational grid system such as the zodiac. Uh, the, there's a, from this period, you, there's this Babylonian compilation of different texts from this period, different thing, results from this period, uh, the, the Enuma, Anu, and Leo, uh, which was in, the, our copy of it, I believe, was inscribed somewhere around the 8th millennium BC, or 800 BC, excuse me, not 8th millennium, but it's 1st millennium, but it's around 700 BC, but it's believed to reflect earlier omen literature, which may go back to the 2nd millennium BC. Um, while individual constellations may be known in this early period, there's no real, in, like, some of the constellations they know in this period correspond to constellations in the zodiac, but there's no concern of the zodiac as an identifiable group. Now, the early foundations of the zodiacal system were like you start seeing set down um, in, a, in a text known as the Mulapin, which is again it's somewhere around 700 or so BC, uh, but likely reached its form its final form at the end of the second um, millennium BC, around 1000 BC. So, it, and what it does is it lists the constellations. Uh, in particular along three broad bands in the sky, roughly parallel um, to the equator, and, and it's described as three, the three paths of the gods. And one of these is, 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 is a kind of equivalent to what we would call the zodiac, but instead of 12 constellations, there's 17. Now people, well, how could there be 17? Well, see, peop what people don't realize is when other people look in the sky with other concerns, they may not make the same pictures out of stars that we do. Um, they, they may th see things very, very differently, and they may group these stars into different constellations, not in the same patterns we see them. Uh, so you have to, t and, and some of these were broken, they were broken up differently, they were, it's an entirely different system, although some of the constellations roughly matched our constellations in the zodiac that we're familiar with. Not all of them did, and obviously with 17, that wasn't really going to be the case. Um, now, what the key point in the development um, of a more intricate system occurs in beginning in the 7th century BC when the um, Babylonians start keeping diaries of the night sky. And that's a key development. They, they write down everything they see, you know, basically ha have everything. They, and, and by this point, they've developed a very sophisticated mathematics as well. Um, and, and that's when astrology really takes off in a big way in Babylon. And that's when you really see the, the, um, these developments take off. And 
somewhere around 465 BC or so, you start to see the first reference to the zodiac as a group. And assuming it could have been a little earlier, because this is just what we have, but it's certainly you don't see it, let's say, 8 or 900 BC, so it's somewhere in that range. Um, and at that point, you start seeing the casting of horoscopes and things like that. So hence, with this outline, the idea of the zodiac going back to, say, 10,000 BC is just pure fantasy. Um, now, the astrological system of the Babylonians uh, had developed, spread to some surrounding cultures, particularly in, with, with, with the Greeks. Um, and certainly, the spread became accelerated further when Alexander the Great conquered much of the known world. And what happens then, too, is when, when the Greeks adopted it, they also they tied the zodiac in with Greek cosmological ideas. Um, in fact, in the at this point in the in the Seleucid period, after the Hellenization of much of the old of the old um, occupied empire, that the Babylonian astrology and astronomy entered its most creative period. Because now you've got this merging of the Babylonian system with the uh, Greek ideas. Um, now Egypt in all of this. Until maybe the, the early 20th century, a lot of people thought Egypt was the birthplace of the zodiac and, and the birthplace of astrology because in late antiquity it, it became basically the most productive place in terms of this, the, where the best ast astronomers and astrologers were from Egypt. But this is in this Hellenistic period. Um, the Egyptians were certainly interested in the heavens, but for example, their mathematics compared to the Babylonians was relatively less sophisticated um, it, and didn't really match the theoretical tools the Babylonians had in predicting the night sky. Now, the Egyptians did devise a calendrical system based upon the heliacal rising of stars, uh, with, you know, the, the Deccan system. Uh, but even this didn't occur until, let's say, the first intermediate period in the Middle Kingdom. Um, there's certainly nothing equivalent to Babylonian astrology in ancient Pharaonic Egypt, and uh, n no use of the zodiac until the Hellenistic period with the Ptolemaic dynasty. Um, so the Egyptians really were not that important in terms of the development of the zodiac until that period. And then what happens is. In fact, what you will find is that the, the, that when the under the under the Ptolemaic uh, dynasty, the system of decans and the system and the Babylonian system and or the Greco-Babylonian system get and the Egyptian decan system get merged, and and at that point, with the Greek mathematics, the the Egyptian um, astrology becomes very very sophisticated, and at that point, you you would find Egypt being associated with the zodiac and astrology, but not before then. So the idea that, the, for example, Horus, which goes many millennia before that time, being, the, being based on the zodiac is just absolutely absurd. And, yeah, and, 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 and this in itself pretty much undermines a key point of their theory. Another important factor in, in these discussions is, is the idea of the astrological ages, and that involves something called the precession of the equinoxes. Now, due to the wobble in the Earth's axis, the tropical year, which is the sun, the length of time the sun takes to go from, let's say, spring equinox to spring equinox, um, it's based on the solar year, um, is about 20 minutes shorter than the sidereal year, which is the sun's position the length of time it takes the sun to get to the same position in the sky. Um, this causes the sun over time on the spring equinox to rise in different constellations of the zodiac moving backwards, hence precession. Uh, so the, hence they call it the precession of the equinoxes. Now, what Zeitgeist does is, according to what, what constellation the sun rises in, that would be the that would determine the age it is in. So, and and they divide the sky up. Um, and now, if you read the sources, whether it be Zeitgeist or Murdoch or Massey, there's some disagreement on exactly where the break is according to whatever standards they're using. 
but generally they're within a century or two of each other. They're like, you, you, and um, sometimes I think there was some manipulation to to get things exactly the way so they could always say that they're enter, we're about to enter the age of Aquarius. Uh, for example, in in the 19th century they had the the age of Pisces beginning earlier, like about 250 BC, um, because and you get the feeling it was kind of geared so it would end around 1900 a um, 1900 AD because that's when they wanted they wanted to see we're entering the age of Aquarius and then some people had it geared for 1 AD because that would make Jesus line up at that point and more recently I've actually seen a couple books where they say that we're going to enter the uh, age of Aquarius in 2012 guess why um, so but the be that it may, I'll, I'll go with what Zeitgeist gives since that's the one most people are familiar with, which is say, and they're all around, like I said, they're all close. Um, age of Taurus would be 4300 to 2150, roughly. Uh, 2150, to one, eight, one, 2150 BC to 1 AD would be Age of Aries. The current period from 1 AD to 2150 AD is Pisces, and then 2150 AD begins the Age of Aquarius. That's, and then the whole thing, the movement through the 12 constellations would be, they call the great year. Now, procession itself, it's a fact. There's no, no, no one, certainly, that, that, there's no, no issue with that. Um, but the idea that it was known to ancient societies is, let's just say, extremely dubious. Um, the fact is, all the evidence indicates it was discovered in the, last few centuries BC with Hipparchus as the most likely candidate. Now there are a couple other candidates for the discovery not um, that have been suggested. Um, one of them is Aristarchus of Samos. Uh, now Aristarchus of Samos, it appears that um, he had all the necessary information but we don't have any evidence he put it, to, put it all together and made the conclusion. Um, also suggested was the Babylonian astronomer, uh, astrologer Kidnu. Um, it was suggested he knew procession by uh, Paul Schnabel. He made that suggestion in 1923, but that was pretty much decisively refuted by Otto Neugebauer. Um, now, Aristarch, as I said, Aristarchus may have known, but if I, even if either of them did, let's say one of these two actually did discover, and we just don't have the evidence for it, um, the most that would push it back is a century or two. Uh, so that's still far, far too late for anything that like appears in Zeitgeist, uh, because they need people to know about this it, for it to be pretty much common knowledge about 3000 BC, and that's just not going to be the case here. Um, so r right away you can see you have some issues, but there's an even and and by the way I would point out that 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 this theory in Zeitgeist not only needs you to know that that the sun is moving up. To the, according to the background of the sky, relative to the background of the sky, that it's moving backwards in time, but it requires the zodiac to be in place because it's all being based on these astrological ages. You need the zodiacal sign. For example, Egypt used a system of decans. Now, you could say, well, one that they may be, someone that could have discovered procession with relation to the decans rather than the zodiac, but the system in Zeitgeist requires, well, there's no evidence of that, first of all, but the system in Zeitgeist requires the zodiac, which Egypt didn't use. Um, so, but more importantly, another problem they have is, first of all, the zodiac isn't even developed until 500 BC, so it can't be any earlier than that. Um, so it can't be 3000 BC because if the zodiac developed over a period of centuries in the first millennium BC, you can't say it was known in 3000 BC. The other problem is they're basing it on an entirely different breakup of the sky, where the system that the, that zeitgeist or whoever is basing it on is generally a modern one. Um, although there's some disagreement, they're generally pr all pretty close, but they're basing it on a modern division of the sky, not the one used at the time. In fact, if you look at, uh, let's say, um, the writings of Ptolemy, which is in the second century AD, he's referring to the, on the spring equinox, the sun rising in Aries. Now, under any of the modern systems, uh, it, the sun would certainly be in Pisces by the second century AD. But he's describing it in Aries. And the reason he's describing it as Aries because under the system used then, which is referred to by historians of science as Babylonian System B, 
it was in Aries. The sky was divided differently. In fact, it would not enter Pisces until about eight or nine hundred A.D. So, if Jesus were, for example, the the personification of the sun in Pisces, as is accused, he showed up like seven or eight centuries too early. Um, so. Right away, you've got major, major, major issues here. Um, just incredibly anachronistic issues. And there's really not many, not a whole lot that the backers of Zeitgeist can do about it. They're just flat out wrong. And, but I, I will now next go into some of the um, counter arguments. Obviously, uh, with essentially the core of the theory um, it presented in, in astrotheology and zeitgeist and material like that, essentially being complete and total hogwash, uh, this would present a bit of a problem. Um, however, what's interesting is how many of the supporters were even were basically unaware that there was a problem, um, <laughs> that they really had no idea. Uh, and, and, and you see this in a number, sometimes they just take these things for granted. Um, as I mentioned before, that the, the great antiquity of the use of the zodiac, and in fact it isn't the case. Um, now, it, it's interesting to see what happens as they become aware, as the material begins to get critiqued. And I think a, an interesting case here um, is again with Dan Murdoch slash Acharya S. And her growing awareness that Things weren't quite what she thought they were. Um, uh, particularly, in, for example, and, 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 and here I will mention an exchange she had with um, Mike Lacona, who was a professor of New Testament at Southern Evangelical Seminary, uh, who seems to have been the one to sort of make her aware that she has some issues uh, with this material um, in, in the Christ conspiracy. Uh, that when that Lacoon had reviewed, Murdoch had, had basically seemed oblivious to the problems with her theory. Uh, she cited a group of 18th and 19th century authors, occultists, and various other people who had dated the Zodiac back 15,000 years, 17,000 years, 30,000 years, and even longer. Um, and the closest of these being only 10 millennia too early, um, she further demonstrated uh, the rather insular nation, nature of her research by um, relaying long refuted claims that the Dendera Zodiac that was discovered in Egypt was over 10,000 years old. It actually is more like 2,000 years old and includes inscriptions of events occurring from the same period. Now, not surprisingly, this just happens to be when the temple was constructed and in fact, it, if you look at it, it actually has a conflation of, uh, of Greco-Roman and Egyptian ideas which indicates that it post-dates both periods. Um, so both developments, so they, I mean, you get Deccans and the Zodiac, and it, it, on the matter of procession, she basically follows Gerald Massey in connecting various ages to the Zodiac, uh, of the, and merely just, a, so it, hence the, again, the antiquity of this knowledge is just presumed. Uh, at, the, at this point, um, which would have been 1999, there's no indication she had even ever heard of Hipparchus. He certainly never even mentioned in her book, which, I mean, if you're going to write about procession, that's like one of, one of the first names you would kind of deal with, but she just seemed completely, at that point, um, completely oblivious. Uh, um, now, what ends up happening at this point um, is that, that uh, Lacona criticized her on this very issue. Um, and in fact cited a number of people. Um, he, he had um, communicated with uh, someone named Noel Swerglo, who's an, an expert on ancient astronomy, ancient science. Um, he's a recognized expert in this field. And, and he just ripped her to shreds. I mean, it was, it was not a... When he, his his uh, description of her work was or of the ideas that she was presenting was, was not pretty. Um, now what happens is, uh, at this point Murdoch responded, um, and, and, and obviously in a bit of agitation, and made the, and basically she stated, and I quote, while Lacona himself uses experts 
so entrenched in the mainstream perspective that they are unable to do research into anything new, such as the information I provide, and, and cite quite thoroughly. He nevertheless attacks my sources, calling them non-experts, non-scholarly. He said, well, in fact, that's what they are. Um, but it's kind of amusing also when you think about it, because she's presented nothing new. She actually presented long, outdated ideas from a century earlier um, or more. Uh, now, as I mentioned, Lacona had had contacted Swerdlow. Swerdlow had replied with the scathing rebuke of Murdoch. Um, and Murdoch's response to that criticism in particular, which I admit was really not pretty, um, was to counter that the views of Lacona and Swerdlow were quote, absolutely false and absurd, and state, stated that to, not, to deny that Chaldean astronomers had a zodiac centuries to millennia prior to the Christian era was beyond ridiculous. Well, um, first of all, that someone who believes the pyramids were not built by the Egyptians challenging Noel Swordlow's grasp on history is not the only thing in this exchange that was beyond absurd. As for the statement of the Chaldean astronomers, uh, I would point out that it's rather misleading. Neither Lacona nor Swerdlow denied the Chaldean astronomers of the Zodiac centuries before the Christian era. It's the millennia part of it, the end of the range, that they denied, and that is what Murdoch's arguments, in fact, require. Um, and, of course, that's where they fail. I mean, everyone agrees it was centuries before the Christian era, but... The problem is it wasn't millennia, which is what her theory requires. Um, Murdoch defended the uh, antiquity of the Zodiac um, using, at that point, using uh, various sources, the Catholic Encyclopedia, the Funk and Wagnalls Encyclopedia, uh, someone named E. Walter Maunder, and an artifact she called the Caranovo Zodiac. Um, for an early date of procession, she again cited Maunder and, and made a reference to Webster's biographical dictionary to Kidnu as a discoverer of procession, and also a comment by astronomer Edward C. Krupp. Um, she then issued a curt dismissal with the so much for Lacona's experts. Uh, um, as we shall see, th these are words she would learn have the taste of crow. Um, the Catholic Encyclopedia was in fact published early 20th century and really is rather outdated on many topics, not the least of which is this one. There's also much confusion in the art article Murdoch quotes as it equates the early dates of astrology with an early date of the zodiac. Uh, as already discussed, early texts from astrology in the region were related to omens and not zodiacal astrology. Uh, it was omen-based astrology. Murdoch did not specify what edition of the Funk and Michaels Encyclopedia she used, but it's certain similar outdated information probably applied there as well. Um, certainly none of the sources are at the same level as actual experts on the Babylonian texts uh, that can easily be cited. Now, Maunder, uh, the person I mentioned, uh, E. Walter Maunder, Edward Walter Maunder, was, he was an astronomer at the, at the uh, turn of the 20th century, um, who also happened to be a Christian. He was neither an historian nor an Assyriologist. Um, he basically was relaying ideas that were commonly held at the time, but are now obsolete. And his, and his book, by the way, was published just about the time that Franz Xaver Kugler began his major studies of the cuneiform tablets that pretty much made everything prior to it obsolete. Uh, thus, Maunder's book is thoroughly outdated and his opinions are irrelevant to contemporary discussions. Now, when you get to something called the Caranovo Zodiac, um, it's actually referred to by scholars as the Caranovo Seal. It's a disc divided into quadrants and found in what is today Bulgaria. Uh, it, it was declared a zodiac by an amateur researcher named Richard D. Flavin, I believe is the person's name, who wrote an article that was originally published in a journal founded by actual zoologist but pseudo-archaeologist Barry Fell. Um, no scholar familiar with the Caranovo culture has followed Flavin's lead for quite obvious reasons. The alleged, he basically looks at these symbols and says, ah, they look, they look like the zodiacs. Well, they really don't. Um, the alleged connections are 
pretty much the pictographic equivalent of seeing animal shapes in clouds. Uh, furthermore, other artifacts have been found in that region with similar symbols that were linked to other cultures and that culture that had nothing to do, that weren't in that setup and and weren't necessarily anything to, you know, to do. Now, honestly, nobody knows what these symbols are. Um, but, I mean, things, you'll see similar type symbols with the, Vin the Vinca culture, the Minoans. Now, while we may never know the exact significance of what these symbols really meant, the supposed correspondence to the zodiac are really, when you look at them, are really totally unconvincing. Uh, but let's say, for sake of argument, let's say Caranovo or some other suggested um, Stone Age zodiac, some Neolithic zodiac, somebody out there used the zodiac prior to Babylon. Okay, let's just say for sake of argument. Um, it still doesn't really help Murdoch's case because there's no evidence Egypt, Babylon, Persia, or any culture of North Africa or the ancient or the east or the, that, that region had the zodiac prior to the first millennium BC. Any of the relevant cultures. Um, if that if someone had it earlier, it obviously had used it earlier, it obviously had no legs and died out. Um, and it was developed anew. There's, so it doesn't help her because it still makes no connection between the Zodiac and, and Horus or whatever. Um, it just isn't there. Now, again, turning to procession, the citation of Maunder, as discussed earlier, is irrelevant. Um, similarly, the citation of Webster's Biographical Dictionary on Kidnu reflects outdated scholarship, as I've discussed Kidnu already. Um, and, and as I pointed out, even if the uh, this, even if the citation had been correct, Kidnu uh, would still be far. From, it only he's only like a couple centuries earlier than Parkas, so it really doesn't help things at all for her. Um, now, the most interesting, the most interesting of these is is. Citations was at Edwin C. Krupp, the astronomer Edwin C. Krupp. Uh, Murdoch had quoted Krupp on the possibility of an earlier knowledge of procession than Hipparchus. Uh, all Krupp did was noted, note some people had given circumstantial evidence that could indicate an earlier knowledge, but never definitively endorsed that view. Furthermore, I mean, to be honest, Krupp was not really kind of outside his field in that on that particular discussion. Um, in terms of Assyriology and in terms of, he's, he's an astronomer. Uh, for example, he, he raised, a, like the one piece of circumstantial evidence was the possibility of matching various ages with the worship of bulls and rams, etc. Not only does this present a problem because generally they're not, use, again, they're using the wrong division of the sky, but also, for example, the ram the, is not associated with the constellation Aries uh, until the, until very late, um, that you, you don't have the ram associated with Aries at all until the, the that's actually was a Greek innovation. Um, the 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 uh, Babylonians had associated that const, that constellation with a farmhand, at least in, in the early Babylonians. Um, it, it was only into in the, the Greeks, and then later it became. The Babylonians during the Hellenistic period may have associated with the ram, but earlier it wasn't. So during the age of Aries, there was no ram associated with the constellation, you know, a constellation Aries, the ram. It was something else entirely. Um, and what, what's interesting there is that Lacona then decided to contact Krupp directly and ask him uh, about what Murdoch had said and about what. Um, also about Neural Smurdlo, uh, who he had contacted, and, and Krupp's response was, and I'm quoting here, Professor Smurdlo is well informed on the ancient history of astronomy and astrology, and his report to you reflects current scholarly opinion formulated by textual evidence. Although people have traditionally projected terrestrial concerns and priorities onto the sky and celestial myth, the detailed astrological mapping your opponent advocates is not supported by evidence and certainly cannot be tracked two millennia or more as described. Thus, even her best source, Krupp, basically sided with Lacona and Swerdlow against her. Um, so that pretty much tells you where that finishes. Now, given uh, 
information provided in the exchange, um, that Murdoch's Sons of God was basically written uh, prior to the initial exchange, although published after it began. And many of the basically the same similar arguments um, appear there. Uh, she seems cognizant of the issues with procession. Her sources are the typical things, you know, like 18th and 19th century authors, um, to which she adds, and, and she also cited Maunder, who I mentioned already. She also cited someone else named Thomas Maurice, whose work was published in 1794. Uh, yeah. She again raised Dendir and Caranovo and also cited a a, a book that's sort of been kicking around for a few decades, some, something called Hamlet's Mill, which also theorized an early knowledge of procession. It's generally considered pseudo-scholarship. It was actually by two professors uh, who were reviving the long-dead theory of pan-Babylonianism. Uh, no one really takes it seriously. Um, and, and they rely, and they themselves rely on the same 18th and 19th century authors and do not deal with modern evidence at all, do not deal with the fact that we know how the Zodiac developed. We actually have the evidence in front of us, you know, we have it. But they never deal, in that book, they never deal with that at all. They just run on like crackpot etymologies and various other things. Now, Murdoch later in 2009, um, in her book Christ in Egypt, uh, although she, she did admit that Eric Horning, who is one of the world's leading Egyptologists, said that Egypt did not use the Zodiac prior to the Ptolemaic period. But she insisted that a closer examination of currently available data might allow for an earlier date. So what is this currently available data? It's actually the parade of irrelevant sources mentioned in the Lacona exchange that appeared in Sons of God five years earlier. I'm not making this up. Um, <laughs> that's the citation she gives. It's from her own book, Sons of God. Uh, that basically is a recap of the, the arguments or the recap of what went on with Lacona um, and a few other earlier sources. Uh, now, Murdoch also returns once more to Dendera, uh, alluding to its depiction being as much as 10,000 years old by some amateur estimates. Uh, the source she cites, Jules Bartholomew St. Hilaire, was an ad he was someone who admitted in that he was an amateur. The funny thing is, though, he didn't agree with her. <laughs> and she's citing him as amateur evidence. Well, no. Um, and, and in fact, in fact what, what he writes is, the, and I'm quoting here, the reader will remember the controversy occasioned by the famous zodiac discovered in this temple and which at present occupies an obscure place in one of the lower halls of the Imperial Library in Paris. Um, it was at first imagined that this zodiac represented the aspect of the heavens five, six, or even 10,000 years ago. A multitude of inferences were drawn from this hypothesis, each more certain and weighty than the rest. The Partisans of the Origin des Cultes, which is a book by Charles Francois Dupuy, which is translated as Origins of, of All Religions or Origins of Religious Worship, uh, triumphed, and this unexceptional evidence confirmed their views. The mistake, the mistake was rendered ridiculous enough when it was proved that this pretended Egyptian zodiac, supposed to be anterior to the deluge, was only a poor astronomical work of the first century of our era, attributable to some ignorant Greek or Roman artist. So, um, all St. Hilaire was citing was the initial speculation of others, but states that this that this mistake was rendered ridiculous. The, uh, so she can't, doesn't even understand that the person she's citing in support was actually against her conclusion. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that in, his, in discussing his amateur status, uh, St. Hilaire stated, uh, I did not pretend, as I have said before, to understand or interpret the hieroglyphics, nor have I made any new discovery. My acquaintance with these enigmas, sculptured on the walls of palaces and temples, is derived from the writings and researches of the younger Champollion, Wilkinson de Rouge, Priest Lipsiu, Mariette, and other Egyptian historiographers. The discoveries made by Champollion are not disputed, and I rely on the interpretations of the learned. 
whose labors I do not pretend to criticize. Uh, perhaps, uh, rather than beating a long dead horse, Murdoch should learn, consider emulating this amateur. Um, now, in the same conversation, Murdoch also writes off the rejection of an early date for Dendera by, some, by an, an Elijah J. Burrett, who was a contemporary of St. Hilaire, as, as, quote, motivated by bibliolatry. Now, while the debate over the Dendera Zodiac did initially split along skeptical versus Christian lines, there's no doubt among scholars of any persuasion that it's basically 2,000 years old. Um, now, while and admittedly, Burrett was perfectly gleeful that a challenge of the Bible had been overcome, but Murdoch ignored his reasons for the confident dismissal of an early date, and basically they were the same ones outlined by the guy, the person she quoted supposedly in support, St. Hilaire. They're basically the same reasons. Look, this isn't. This is only a couple thousand years old. Thus, both the amateur and the bibliolater Burrett uh, were in complete agreement. Um, and both of these 19th century figures were actually more current in their understanding of the Dendera Temple than was Murdoch herself. Uh, now, as for other evidence, she, again, in this book, raises Caranovo and then a typical 18th and 19th century authors. Um, and she does add a few other names uh, that... that that were basically respected but woefully outdated sources, Budge, Remy Rage, and William Muir. Uh, you know, but, but even Budge, who was becoming outdated in his own day, actually didn't believe that the Egyptians had the Zodiac prior to the Ptolemaic era. Um, <laughs> but it's essentially again relying on sources before the real the current information was known. Um, she, while that group may have been at least respected scholars, she also used someone um, named Orlando J. Schmidt as a source, who's another uh, one that Murdoch called upon. Um, in fact, I what, what I would uh, if you want to, all you need to know about Schmidt is. Um, Given he basically he was a pseudo scholar, uh, a crackpot from the late 19th, early 20th century. In fact, in 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 in, in Nature there was a review of his book, uh, and, and the, which closed with the following comment: Before he writes another book of his startling discoveries, we hope he will read the current literature of the subject and will remember that assertion is not evidence and that theories and hypotheses are not proofs. Uh, this the bankruptcy of her positions further illustrated by her needing to scour sources recognizes crackpots even a century ago for additional support. Um, her final source on this matter was someone named John Anthony West, who carries even less weight than her outdated ones. Uh, West was um, drawing on the occultist R.A. Schwaller de Lubitz. Uh, while the latter's photograph, while the Lubick's photographs of uh, Luxor Temple, Temple are actually quite spectacular, and, and you know a lot of Egyptologists will use them because they are great photographs. Uh, his his conclusions about Luxor Temple are akin to the mystical silliness of pyramidology, um, and he, along with his wife and daughter, uh, basically had built something akin to an esoteric cult. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the final comment I think she made that, that she made an argument also in that book raising the proximity of Babylon to Egypt as an issue. The Egyptians she claims would surely have known of the Babylonians' use of the zodiac. Well, first of all, even the Babylonians didn't use the zodiac until sometime around 500 BC. Uh, so before that, it's out of the question anyway. But no one, furthermore, no one is saying the Egyptians didn't know about the Babylonians using the Zodiac, they're just saying that the Egypt, there's no evidence the Egyptians used it themselves. Um, they had their own system, and it wasn't until, they didn't use the Zodiac until the time of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Um, now, Zeitgeist, of course, followed Maxwell and Murdoch in this regard. Um, and the by this point, the question of the antiquity of, this, of the use of the zodiac and of the knowledge of procession is was more hotly debated, um, and, and, they, and 
Although Peter Joseph probably wasn't aware of it, but after, it, but Murdoch at least had some experience at this point uh, in in these issues. Um, now, Murdoch and Joseph again in this recent um, source guide, <clears throat> uh, the evidence they present is more failed sources. Um, the it, in, at one point, the, it, it mentions the antiquity of the uh, in the source guide. It says the antiquity of the idea of a zodiac is disputed, but it may have been formulated as early as four thousand or more years ago. Wrong. Uh, all that's offered, by the way, as evidence for this is a quote from Mur uh, Murdoch from Christ in Egypt, referring to Caranovo and Maunder, uh, which isn't really much at all. Um, it's also interesting to, that it, by this point, she states the antiquity of the zodiac is disputed. In actuality, there's no real dispute. Uh, scholars are in agreement. It, it developed in the first millennium BC in Babylon. There's no dispute about it. Um, it but it does appear that Murdoch has backtracked once more here, as because she now acknowledges that what Lacuna and Swordlo asserted was not absolutely false and absurd after all. Um, turning to procession. The main discussion in the source guide merely quotes her discussion in Sons of God citing Hamlet's Mill and once more used a corrupt citation even though the clarification had dismissed her claims years earlier. But of more interest, because there is actually something else used, and, and at this point, yeah, I think this is the more interesting one, is her is, it, is actually within a secondary discussion of procession in relation to Mithraism, where, she, where they cite um, Mithraic scholar David Alonsi. Uh, and and, the, and the, what the source guide says, and I'm qu quoting here, as we have seen, the knowledge of the procession evidently dates back centuries before being formally described in writing by Hipparchus in the second century BC, and it appears that in Mithraism we possess a clear vestige of myths and traditions developed during the age of Taurus, as well as centuries afterwards, in order to reflect the supposedly proper mythology for that time period. This point was about Mithra's relationship to Taurus is demonstrated quite well by Alansi in his book The Origins of the Mithraic Mysteries. Now, what's actually is demonstrated uh, from this citation is that Murdoch and Joseph have no idea what Alansi was talking about and presented in this book since he never wrote any such thing. Um, and it's just amazing. There's just no connection with reality at all in this matter. Now, Alansi does theorize a link between procession and Mithraism, but he's quite clear that it is the Roman and not the Persian Mithraism wherein this connection is made. Roman Mithraism was a Greco-Roman mystery religion which only has tangential connections to its Persian equivalent. Uh, Joseph and Murdoch are apparently ignorant of this fact, didn't distinguish between the two. Roman Mithraism began to, it, it, it grew out probably out of a, from, according to Alansi, and it seems a good bet, grew, it began as an offshoot of a first century BC cult around the god Perseus, a mystery religion around Perseus, and grew into the, in, it, it, it sort of was an offshoot of that, and it, but it didn't really begin spreading in the Roman Empire until the end of the first century AD, according to Alansi, and it's, and there's general agreement um, on it having an astrological component, although there's some disagreement on whether Alansi's theory of involving procession uh, on the details of that. Uh, Alansi claims it was a re... But here's the important part. Alansi specifically claims Roman Mithraism was a reaction to the recent discovery of procession that he explicitly credits to Hipparchus. In the book, he says Hipparchus discovered procession. <laughs> There's no, I mean, it's right. It's right there. He says it. Um, it's right. It's right in the book. He says that Alansi discovered. I mean, Alansi says that Hipparchus discovered procession. So, I have no idea where she's getting this. I mean, if I, you know, you can go, go right, right, right to the book, and it's right there. Um, furthermore, Alansi understood which Murdoch and Joseph do not, the differences between how the sky was divided in ancient and modern astrology, and he used the correct system for his theory. Because 
his references uh, to the equinox shifting from Taurus to Aries, Joseph and Murdoch assumed he must be referring to some long distant past, but it was all within the boundaries of the accepted understanding of, of procession because it's way their theory of where the where the sky broke up broke up and how it would change ages was completely different from what Alancey was using. Alancey was thought it, this was recently discovered. They were in the age of Aries. They would be in the age of Aries for another eight or nine hundred years if you're talking about the first century A.D. So there's n so he. This was, they just really misunderstood everything. Um, and it's, it's, the, and this is the best thing they had in the Swords Guide. That, you know, the, the, there's, that's the best they had. Now, there were, now, um, Murdoch's obviously written the most on this. There were some others, and, and I'm just going to, just mention them in passing, and I'll just particularly deal with arguments that were different than what was already that, than things I've already discussed. I'm not going to regurgitate the things that have, we've gone over already. Um, Tom Harper, uh, some of you may know that uh, Tom Harper uh, wrote on this topic as well. Now he relied heavily on a bunch of 19th century occultists and at one point in his book he claims a, that images depicting a virgin mother with a divine child in her arms existed in zodiacs on temple ceilings for millennia before the Galilean baby ever saw the light. Uh, perhaps he could direct Egyptologists to such a remarkable find since they haven't found a zodiac of any sort on any temple ceiling until the Ptolemaic era in the last few centuries BC, much less the one that he's describing. Um, it, it's, it's, again, you know, it's, so I don't, now, and, and not, Bill Darlinson, um, another author, uh, create, rejected Hipparchus's priority based on only what could only be described as a creative application of numerology. Um, and, and what he did was relied on Joseph Campbell, who despite being a rather entertaining personality on television, a lot of people don't realize that Campbell was more, into literar more in the field of literary criticism than he was a an historian um, or an expert on a seriology or anything like that. He wasn't, uh, but he was entertaining. Uh, but Campbell had rejected Hipparchus's priority uh, by insisting, it, it's this weird argument, by he insisted 432 was a magic number, multiply it by 60, which he said was the average resting heartbeat of man, and arrived at 25,920, the approximate length of the great year. Uh, not only is there no good reason to associate these numbers at all, except to reach a desired conclusion after the fact, the way Campbell just did, uh, the magical 432 claim is achieved by Campbell running through various numerical gymnastics to arrive at 43,200 or 432,000 in various mythologies, which are, you know, um, the, the only problem, you know, which would be 40, 432 followed by various zeros. Uh, this significance, is, although it may seem superficially interesting, um, is only significant because we, in our culture, use the decimal numbering system that wasn't in use in the ancient world. Uh, and this is the problem with numerical, numerological games, and I can tell you this is a former mathematics major. After the fact, you can always play with numbers to make anything out of anything. Trust me, I can do it just as easily. I can come up with all kinds of weird combinations. It doesn't mean anything. Um, the, the Darlinson also relied on some um, authors who were basically into pyramidology. Uh, so th there's not not a whole lot um, go going on there. Now there there is one other argument that that is at least interest that that I've heard that is at least interesting, and I, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, I, this was also mentioned by Darlinson, um, and this is the, the the last argument on in this that I'll I'll deal with, uh, and that and it, I think it was also mentioned briefly by Murdoch, but not in detail. Darlinson went into it in more detail, um, and that has to do with a sculpture um, by Michelangelo uh, of Moses 
with horns, which he refers to as, as indicating Mo Moses, of course, being in the age of Aries. Um, and the problem with this is, in fact, that, that, that the, the, what it all is based upon is a mistranslation in the Vulgate of um, the, see, the, the Hebrew word involved, Karim, the Hebrew word is, means basically to project outward. It is, is like the root of it is to like project outward. It can be used either to project outward or to gore is the root word, which obviously then you could see it, the, the root word in various forms could be uh, shining, you know, emitting light, basically projecting out light, or horns, something with horns, because that's also projecting outward to gore. And, and there's, the, <clears throat> there's various forms of it, of this root word, that means to like to project outward to gore or whatever. Um, and so you have this issue here of how to translate it, and it's in context. And the, the art, and basically what ended up happening was that the, the, um, the, the word was translated in the Latin Vulgate as horn, so it's, it's so according to Darlinson thought that this meant that, and, and this was the way it was trans, mistakenly translating the Vulgate, and you've got to remember at this point Jerome was translating the Hebrew into Latin as he was learning Hebrew, so, <laughs> and, and it, the, this word seemed to, he translated it as horns, Moses' face was horned, but in fact, uh, and Harlan, Dar Darlinson makes the argument, see this proves that Moses was believed to be horned and ram and a ram and therefore Aries. Never mind, of course, the Aries, of course, as I mentioned, is as associated with the ram as much later. But more importantly, it's not, it's actually means his face was shining. Um, it, it's it's just, you have to understand the context. In fact, if you read the the uh, the the actual Hebrew, it doesn't say his face was whatever, horned or shining. It says the skin of his face, which means the whole thing was horned. So if, if you're trying to argue that it meant horns, that would less make him the make it the age of the ram as much as the age of the porcupine. Um, so what obviously in the context and, and if you read the context and in fact the same word similar word is used for, for sunshine elsewhere in the Bible it, it's obviously means shining so this was just but Michelangelo's sculpture of Moses with horns is based on a mistranslation by Jerome in the Vulgate and that's pretty much the argument there so as you can see Zodiac first millennium BC um, processions discovered in the last couple centuries BC there is absolutely no doubt about it and their whole argument just collapses at this point we're going to turn to what I think are some moments in Zeitgeist in particular where there are just some things that are unintentionally funny um, and here's where they try to draw things to try to claim that that various things in the Bible refer to astrological ages. Um, now, Joseph at this point is clearly just repeating the teachings of Jordan Maxwell. Um, at no point do, does he allow the text to speak for themselves. It, in their obvious context, but instead selects isolated items to fit predetermined outcomes. The result, as I mentioned, will end up being in points unintentionally amusing, uh, but it only serves to demonstrate that he, Joseph has really no familiarity with the text whatsoever. Um, and for example, it, he says that the use of the term aeon or age in the Bible refers to astrological ages. However, the text cite, that he cites either refer to historical periods of the past by as like bygone ages, or to the Jewish messianic hopes of the end of all things in the kingdom of God. There's nothing in the context of the cited passage remotely referring to any so-called astrological ages. And as pointed out, um, this sort of thing wasn't even a coherent idea at that point since the Zodiac develops much later. Uh, now the references to these 
just to add, in, this is one of the amusing parts, is the references to the biblical passages are often incomplete or meaningless and demonstrate an appalling incompetence for someone claiming to have expertise. For example, in the film, when he's referring to these occasions where, the, where it has ages, he refers to, it has references to 1 Corinthians 3.18 and 1 Corinthians 10.11, but they're given as Corinthians 3 and Corinthians 10. Um, Ephesians 1.21 and 2.7 is referred to as Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 21. Um, Hebrews 6, 5, and 9, 9, or Hebrews 6 and Hebrew 9, Revelation 15, 3 is Revelation 15. Now, a single such error uh, could be written off as just a slip, but the cumulative effect of so many similar errors uh, obviously means he really isn't that familiar with the text at all. Um, it's kind of, it's sort of, and, he's, and quoting it that way is about, makes about as much sense as saying, why, well, that's in Bible 17. No, no. Um, now, it gets worse when he turns to the supposed passages giving direct evidence of particular astrological ages. Um, he's not, and he, again, he's not re repeating much. Uh, the, he's, he's not coming up with m much new. It's, he's just repeating things, is what I meant to say. Um, and he claims, for example, the reason Moses breaks the tablet is wrongly interpreted by Bible scholars as anger at the Israelites' idolatry. Uh, so what does he think it's from? He claims that, that Moses represents the age of Aries and the golden calf represented the outgoing age of Taurus and that Moses was angry the Israelites were worshipping God under the wrong astrological age. Uh, furthermore, the, he says the shofar is also said to signify Aries. Now, when it comes to Jesus, he's, he associates Jesus with Pisces, and so, they, so he focuses on any mentions of fish. Um, his initial choice of two fishermen in the Gospel of Mark is supposedly alludes to Pisces, as does the fish symbol used by Christians. In the original version of the film, there were also references in the original version to Jesus as the great fisherman and to the Pope's mitre as symbolic of a fish head and hence Pisces. Uh, even the coming age of Aquarius is said to be foreshadowed in Luke 22.10. It, uh, it stated that the apostles asked Jesus where the next Passover will be and he instructs them to meet a man bearing a pitcher of water and follow him into the house he enters. Here the Passover is interpreted as passing over to the next astrological age. Uh, the man bearing the pitcher of water and is the water bearer Aquarius and the house is the corresponding astrological house where the spring equinox next occurs in the processional cycle. As I said, all this is straight from Jordan Maxwell and appeals only to those seeking sensational claims without having, actually having to do any real homework. Um, given the ability, inability of Joseph to even get basic citations correct, it shouldn't surprise us that he hasn't bothered to understand these con passages in their context, since given his citations, he probably couldn't find them. Um, it's especially galling to hear Joseph, in the midst of regurgitating the crackpot exegesis of Jordan Maxwell, questioning real scholars on the subject of Moses. The reason that most biblical scholars believe Moses' anger is directed at idolatry is that, unlike Joseph, they've actually read the text. For once you read the text, there's no question on the matter, because the texts say God's angry at them for idolatry. Uh, you know, just, for example, look at Exodus 32:31. There's no doubt. That's what it's about, because it says so. Now, this, it's not really a question. Um, at this point, but uh, for some people, I guess, you know, you, they just don't really understand these things and, and don't understand that that's, you know, it, it does help to actually read the text first before determining what the text says uh, or, or what it's trying to say. Um, nor do the rest of his arguments concerning Moses warrant any serious reevaluation. As I mentioned, discovery of procession comes along after this period, as does the development of the zodiac itself. Mentions of Aries the ram, as in the ram, because he's talking about a ram, is anachronistic, because I mentioned that the ram is actually a later Greek development. Um, as for the shofar, the reason ram's horns were used by the Israelites is the same reason many cultures used them. 
they make great horns. Um, now, Zeitgeist, uh, but what happens is Joseph and Zeitgeist and others, they, they'll choose certain mentions of rams, fish, etc. when it suits them, but ignores other places where the symbolism would contradict their theory. For example, why did God choose to provide Abraham a ram to sacrifice when this pre-Mosaic period called for a bull? And what are the instructions for Aaron to sacrifice bulls and goats? Was God being nostalgic for the, for the prior ages of Taurus and Capricorn? Would not the crossing of the waters of the Red Sea indicate Aquarius? The entire construct is designed to focus on what matches a preconceived pattern and just ignore anything that doesn't fit. The fact is that bulls, rams, fish, and water are mentioned throughout the Bible because it's an agricultural society. No astrological interpretations needed. These items would arise in any everyday description of the world at in that point in time and in that location. Now, Jesus' association with Pisces is similarly forced into the discussion. First of all, Jesus did not choose two fishermen, by the way, at the outset of his ministry in Mark, but four, the two uh, pairs of brothers of Simon and Andrew, sons of Jonah and James and John, sons, sons of Zebedee. Um, the, nor is the association of Christ with fish the most obvious one. For example, he's called both the Good Shepherd and Lamb of God. Would that not point to Aries? He baptizes with water. Would that not signify? He, he, he has his disciples that rather baptized with water. Would that not indicate Aquarius? He's referred to as a Lion of Judah. Would that not point to Leo? Nowhere is Jesus ever called the fish, nor was he as the original version of the film claimed called The Great Fisherman. As for the Pope's mitre, the design evolved over many centuries and it actually was intended to signify the flames of the Holy Spirit and not a fish head. Um, now, as um, as much of that, as so much of this has been a failure, um, it gets even worse when you think about the fact that, as I pointed out earlier, they're using the wrong division of the sky because at the time, every at the time, um, the age of age of, of Pisces would not have begun until eight or nine centuries early, later, so Jesus was almost a full millennia too early. Um, but this isn't even the worst. The worst is when you get to the whole thing of Aquarius, Luke 22.10, and the, remember the, the uh, seeing the guy with, with, the, with a pitcher of water? Now, I suggest go in there and read the whole thing in context, because what happens is, it's actually the day of preparation for Passover. Jesus instructs two of the disciples to prepare for the feast for that evening. When asked where they should prepare, he gives them specific instructions to go in the city. There they'll find a man carrying a pitcher of water who will lead them to a house. Now what Joseph and these other people leave out is that that house didn't belong to that man. He was nothing more than a house servant. He led them to the master of the house. Thus the figure who Jesus wants him to meet was not that guy with the pitcher of water. He was once he, he led them to the master of the house. He was out of the story. He was gone. Um, he's not mentioned again. The figure was that the master of the house was the one they wanted him to meet, and that wasn't the guy with the pitcher of water. And the owner of the house allowed them to use the upper room. And the passage ends with the disciples preparing the feast that would be the Last Supper. Hence, the Passover is not referring to some event far in the future, as you would try to think by reading, the, by listening to Peter Joseph, but to a meal that occurred that evening, an evening that occurred 2,000 years ago. Um, so I guess by their symbolism then that the age of Aquarius would have begun 2,000 years ago. Of course, that would be a problem since it wasn't even under the division of the sky used then. It was still eight or 900 years till the age of Pisces, much less the age of Aquarius. Um, so... It, the, the whole thing is just complete absurdity. Um, <laughs> now, these interpretations were not unique to Joseph. As I pointed out, similar ones were made by Murdoch in her work, including the source guide. Uh, the evidence for, this, for the um, Moses passage included... Um, references to Edward Carpenter, to Porphyry, and the Church Father Origen. Uh, Carpenter is one of the usual sources in these sorts of things whose work is irrelevant. 
There was no zodiac observed in Egypt, and certainly no age of Aries. As mentioned numerous times, it was adopted in the Ptolemaic era. So, I, I mean, it, um, it is claimed, by the way, it, in, the, in terms of porphyry, which they get via David Alansi, it is claimed that porphyry wrote about bull slaying, referring to a much older tradition, but this simply isn't the case. As is made quite clear by Alansi, the bull slaying aspect only occurs in, Ro in the Roman form of Mithraism, not in the earlier Persian form. And that simply would go back no earlier than the first century BC. So that's just dead wrong. Um, in fact, as, as already mentioned, Alansi credited the development of Roman Mithraism on the recent discovery of procession by Hipparchus. Um, as for origin, his assertion Mithraism is associated with the stars isn't disputed. But again, this is Roman Mithraism and comes many centuries too late to have any bearing on Old Testament passages about Moses. Um, now, for the association of Jesus with Pisces, they use, again, it's, it's, it's various things. Um, are the usual things are used, and it, 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 it and all again, it's all um, things like the use of the fish, which I've explained already explained. Lots of things were used to associate with Jesus, not just fish, um, and this that happened to be one of them. But it was it was known. It's already fairly well known that it was it, it was an acronym and and an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, the Ichthus. Um, so it, it that's pretty well known. Um, so that, and um, in terms of other people, uh, the, generally, it's if they make an argument for it, it's all pretty much in line with that. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about here is that in multiple places of the film, Zeitgeist puts forward a symbol that calls the cross of the zodiac as one of the oldest conceptual symbols in history. It's a representation in, of the zodiac in a circle with perpendicular lines connecting the solstices and equinoxes in the center of the form of cross. There is at least an implicit connection to the cross of Christ being referred, inferred, um, and, and it seems to be associating it with the Celtic cross. Uh, there is, in fact, a, an ancient symbol of a circle with a cross embedded in it that, may, that in some cultures is believed to have represented the sun. However, it's not associated with the zodiac, and it precedes the zodiac by centuries, if not millennia. And it's, that's not particularly shocking. I mean, when you think about it, that symbol is not necessarily that unusual. Having two perpendicular lines is a fairly basic one um, and arose in various cultures for their own reasons, and some of which we may never understand. Um, the, the Celtic cross, by the way, is more, 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 most likely a blending of two symbols, the pagan, that pagan symbol representing the sun, but also, since that was popular in... In, um, in Britain and Ireland, they used that symbol and extended the lines to, um, to form the Latin cross, which went outside the circle, whereas the original symbol was inside the circle, and that formed the Celtic cross. It was a hybrid symbol, but that hybrid symbol was only used by Christians. It was never used earlier by pagans. The pagans always had the... the cross completely embedded in the circle. It was an intentional blending probably to bring the two symbol two symbols together to make because it was very popular and to, um, and this was something commonly done in a lot of during that med medieval period. Uh, but as for the quote cross the zodiac the whole thing with the zodiac that symbol is not associated with the zodiac as for as the, the zodiac in a circle um, there are early examples of the zodiac in a circle, but they're all from the Ptolemaic era, so it's not one of the oldest conceptual symbols, and they don't have the cross in it. The, those earlier ones don't have the cross. That was added much later. Um, the earlier ones, as you see, like in Dendera, uh, just have marks where the solstice, but they don't have the intersecting lines connecting them. So the whole ar that whole argument is pretty much um, ridiculous, and and it's and no one has ever. No one called it the cross of the zodiac. So here, where do we, where are we at the end of all this? Well, the fact is that there was no pattern, as I described, of 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 this sort of astrological religion as they're describing it, going back many thousands of years, based on the zodiac. Because first of all, there wasn't even the zodiac in terms of a defined system. 
that was being used at that point in time. Um, and what you find is, despite all the arguments, the one, the, they'll, they'll come up with all kinds of arguments why, oh no, the, the, you go here, go there, jump, they'll jump all over the place. The one thing they will not do is deal with the hard evidence. They don't address the evidence. At no point do they address the clear evidence for the gradual development of the zodiac in Babylon during the first millennium BC. Never do they interact with what we have, that the initial growth out of Babylon from Sumeria to Babylon of the omen-based astrology, the formative development of the zodiac is one of three bands in the sky, uh, the evolution from 17 to 12 constellations, the adoption by the Greeks, the spread of its use after Alexander's conquest in the beginnings of the Hellenistic era, the synthesis under the Ptolemaic Egyptian rule of the zodiac and Deccan systems, and then the sudden knowledge of procession that, uh, in late antiquity, the development of that knowledge, and then finally the development in and, and also the, the, the different divisions of the sky from late antiquity to today. None of this is ever addressed. It, it, they just evade it. They just ignore it. But unless you can address that, unless you can address this, and th there's nothing you can say. I mean, there's nothing these people can say. There's, it, 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 basically, and you can talk about all the other stuff all you want, but if without the system, which... And, and I'll deal with more when we in, in a future video. I'll talk about the whole December 25th thing, um, but I wanted to get this in terms of their core parts of their system. If you take each piece individually and look at it, it falls apart. I've discussed the Iron Rising Gods already. I've discussed this um, th this sort of astro theology thing, this zodiac thing. It just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. It just isn't there. It isn't there, and unless they can address the evidence, um, the clear evidence in, in the Babylonian, the cuneiform tablets, unless they can address all of that, things scholars have known for about a century now, uh, which they just avoid, um, then everything else is... The, the, it's, it, there, there's nothing they can say. Um, they, can, they can evade it, they can jump around, but the fact is their theory is in, in shambles. It's basically, it's, it's, it's a pile of dust now. Thank you very much for your time.